All right. Good morning and welcome, everyone. Uh, it's May or June 23rd here, and we have a couple specialists uh, from support that are going to speak to us about Nastran and NCAD and some inf uh, meshing information. So uh, today we have James Kubli, who is a technical support specialist here at Autodesk, and we have Alan Fawkes, who is also a uh, specialist here on the sales side. So I will uh, let them take it from here, and thank you for attending. Hey, thanks, Dean. Hey, Alan folks here. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, James. And real quick, um, kind of PowerPoint for you guys before we get into the meshing. Uh, just some information real quick about um, some of the webinar series. Um, we've been doing, you know, this this webinar to really help people with just NASTRAN in particular, NASTRAN NCAD. And just getting them acclimated to what what is available, how to work with the software, et cetera. And and there's there's a few um, uh, subjects that have already been covered. Um, contact was the last one we did with the NCAD, and certainly do some upcoming ones. Um, go to the next slide, James. Um, there are some. Uh, there are some. There's a new 2016 version. We're going to be running that in this particular webinar. Um, there's an update for the 2016. Um, I would definitely recommend you to go to the Autodesk Account Center, download that. Uh, but there's definitely some new self-paced training for you know, getting acclimated to the just to the interface and um, setting up models, post-processing of results, those kind of things. So. Um, definitely recommend going to the to that knowledge center, um, taking a look at that information. Uh, let's go to the next slide, James. And just some recent um, knowledge base articles, uh, pre-stress buckling analysis. Uh, that was a pretty good one. That showed various um, buckling analyses within the NCAD, uh, as well as you know, not only buckling, but uh, nonlinear buckling, um, multiple subcases for a linear buckling analysis. Um, you know, how to delete automatically generated surface contact pairs. So some some good troubleshooting um, things and articles out there for you. Uh, definitely recommend take a look at that. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, James. So what we want to talk about is the art of meshing, and and why do we call it art? Well, meshing is something that is definitely particular. It's it's specific to every single model. And James and I were talking yesterday about, you know, really what is the art of meshing, and and how do why do we call it that? It one of the real most common questions we get for customers is, how do I? I mean, how how do I mesh it? And how do I know I have an adequate mesh? And and those are those are really the best questions because really it it, it it's it's the start of your analysis. You know, how do you know that you have a good mesh? You, you you know you have to mesh it, but how do you know you have a good mesh? And what we want to show is is really how you achieve that. Uh, it's something that's going to vary for every model. I think the main thing is to start meshing it. You know, and, and seeing what you have, there's there's defaults. We want to go over how you adjust these defaults to get really you confidence that you have an adequate mesh. So let's go ahead and, and start here, James. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, obviously, you've got to pick an element mesh size, and that's something that doesn't really. I mean, I think people bring in solid models into the NCAD. You know, you're you're sitting an inventor. You go into the NCAD simulation environment, and you've got to start. You know, where do you start? Well, there are automatic defaults, um, but certainly you come in and override that with the mesh size. A uh, couple of things in this menu. Um, let's take a look at the element order. Um, one of the big, or I wouldn't say big, but it, one of the one of the decisions you have to make is whether you use a linear or parabolic tetrahedron. And what do we mean by this? Well, and it's going to go it, and it's going to make sense at the end of this as far as how we control the mesh and how we ensure we we've, we've got a pretty good mesh, but 
you know, if you have curved surfaces, and you can see in the bottom, there's a red, you know, tetrahedral element, and then there's a, you know, greenish tetrahedral element. But notice that the midside nodes on the green element are along curved surfaces. So the big the big criteria here is whether you have curved surfaces or not. Um, but parabolic elements are generally going to give you more accuracy. Um, you're adding more nodes to the structure, and that's what is. And when we talk about mesh refinement, we're really talking about the size of the model, and that that really is related to the number of nodes in the model. So more nodes, more elements, better accuracy. Um, what else do we have? We had one more thing on this slide, right, James? Yeah, the continuous mm -hmm. mesh. Continuous meshing is a is a check mark there that you've got to be aware of, and primarily for well, not primarily, it's it's for multiple part assembly. So if you're going to have parts that are going to be bonded together, you know, you have parts that are connect that are that are intimately connected. You, you want a mesh that is continuous through those two parts and through that boundary. Um, it's basically going to take into account the tolerance and then join those nodes. So if you do have uh, multiple parts and you want those bonded, you want to have the continuous meshing button checked. If you have uh, parts, multiple parts, and you want contact between them, I would refer you to the webinar we did last week, which was specifically for contact. And that's when you're going to want to uncheck the continuous meshing. Um, then of course you hit update and the whole part gets meshed or the whole assembly gets meshed. Um, settings. Uh, it's probably a good idea to look at the default settings. Uh, make sure what you have there. Uh, do we get into the next slide, James, as far as what those settings are? Ah, good. Okay. So, um, and James, feel free to chime in here. I just wanted to go over sure. these 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 items here I don't and we were talking yesterday generally we don't we don't get into this menu except for like the couple you have highlighted there right like the yeah so ratio, growth rate most situations don't require the use of advanced mesh settings but there are a couple that are I don't know I consider them useful in controlling your element count in order to uh, provide refinement and one of them is uh, the refinement ratio and this sort of controls the overall uniformity of the mesh uh, but it also is very similar to the element growth rate so the element growth rate controls how quickly your model transitions from the very fine mesh in, uh, in detailed areas to the coarser mesh uh, but the refinement ratio con uh, kind of controls the max size and the, uh, the minimum size of elements. So it creates this uniform, and I've, this uniform mesh, and I have always find that handy for dealing with thin parts because you'll get a detailed mesh on one side, let's say there's, or a fine mesh on one side due to some detail, and on the other side of this thin plate you get uh, a large mesh, uh, a very gross overestimated mesh, and then when the, the, the solid meshing tries to match the two faces, that creates problems in meshing a model because you've got a really, really fine mesh that needs to mate to a really, really coarse mesh through the thickness of a very thin part. So tweaking that is helpful and also tweaking the max growth rate is helpful when you're using different uh, refinements. Uh, I'll demonstrate it more in an example model. Yeah. So, so James, if I increase the refinement ratio, um, that's going to that's going to refine it more in that region where there's a fine detail. Well, it's going to, if you increase the refinement ratio, what that's going to do is it's going to force the larger mesh, generally, the larger mesh size to be smaller, to be closer in element size to your uh, uh, smaller elements. Uh, so basically, if you got a, a, a very tight mesh in one area and a very coarse mesh in another, if you increase this refinement ratio, it's going to bring those the the difference in uh, size closer and closer together. Right. And, and, and the growth rate, I mean, we can control the fact that you know, we don't just want, we, we may want refinement, but we don't want it in, in a very specific region. We want it to transition out slower possibly. Correct. So, the, and the goal there 
is is not to just transition slowly. It, it really the goal is so that you don't have a discrete region, and then it's, and then the mesher, the solid mesher that is, has to try to make these quick transitions to the bigger mesh, which mm -hmm. which can give you some you know really skewed elements. And we're trying to get a we're trying to the goal here is is we're trying to refine it try to mesh it, but we're trying not to generate elements that are very skewed, which can lead to some inaccuracies is the idea. So um, what else we cover on that? Uh, I guess that's 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 the settings menu. Yes. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to mention before we get into a model is the mesh table. And this is this is the area where there's the menu. You can give each individual part its own mesh setting. So you can come in here and each part comes in, each each part name is listed there. Uh, so if you had three, four parts as we've shown, it, it'll come in. If you've got a hundred parts, it'll be a hundred parts here. Uh, you can get you, you can get specific about what the mesh size is for each specific part if you'd like, as well as you know, even the element order, parabolic or linear. So and the and the idea is to really get very, you know, I wouldn't say very detailed, but to get you want to, if one part's more of interest, of interest, you possibly want to refine that part by itself, not uniformly over across the whole assembly, is the idea. I don't know. Anything to add on that, James? It's kind of... No, not really. That's, uh, so <laughs> everything, all, all the settings that we went through before are accessible through the mesh table. Uh, I'll, I'll show the mesh table during the demonstration. Uh, when I go through some example models. Okay. Okay. So next slide, or um, yeah, mesh control. Uh, before we get again, before we get into a real model here, we're, this is um, there are there are features to let you refine specific points or faces or edges in the model, and and that's what this menu is about. So once we actually get a mesh on the part, you can go back in and subsequently. Pick an area. I mean, if you know where the high stress, and, and typically you've run an analysis, for example, first, and you know, with a with a uniform mesh, and you know where the high stress is, and maybe some critical areas, and maybe you want to go back in and uh, apply refinement to a surface. You know, so you you would pick the face, or pick the vertex, or point, or pick the edge, and you can give it you you can give that region its own specific mesh size. So a little different than the part. Uh, mesh settings that we just showed you in the table. Here it's a very specific region that I can say refine to this element size in this region. And we'll show you that. Okay. All right. One thing uh, I think we, we will definitely cover is uh, mesh convergence and the reason why you want to do it. Uh, so mesh convergence is very important. I'm, uh, and it, you'd want to do this simply because a uh, running a coarse mesh. All right. Well, let me explain exactly what mesh com convergence is. Mesh convergence is, is when you vary the mesh density, basically from a coarse mesh to an increasing density uh, mesh, in order to see if you have mesh dependency. So as the mesh gets finer and finer, we should, in theory, see the results. Uh, uh, improve or get more and more accurate, I should say, or, or closer to the solution. So a mesh convergence study uh, will show you whether you've got mesh dependency, but it also identifies stress concentrations because what you'll see is, is as we refine the mesh, the stress will keep going up and up and up out of bounds, uh, out of control, whereas if we have convergence or, or we have mesh independence, we will see our results vary only slightly as we keep increasing the mesh. Uh, as an example to that, uh, here's an example. We're looking at like a fillet here. And as we increase the density of the mesh from the first mesh to the second mesh, we see our, our stress does increase. But as we go from the second to third one, it increases still, but it increases at a much, much uh, smaller rate. And we can see uh, from the plot, you can see we're approaching some asymptotic value in theory, and that would be our, our true results there. 
Uh, anything you want to inject, Alan, before? Uh... No, I, I think this is this curve shows it all. I mean, this is really what your goal is. I mean, you you're going to get an F, you're going to get an answer from the finite element analysis solution. It's a matter of how accurate is that? Yeah, uh, I think I think a lot of customers try to jump to the mesh number three, and if not even further, and try to really um, really give the model a lot of elements. I think if you're if you're I think the key for most analysts though should be you know, where is that sweet spot, so to say. You know, do I need you know nine percent accuracy? Do I need five percent? Do I need to keep it under? You know, five percent. Uh, get an idea of what that accuracy is. It might be twenty percent. You know, but that's something that you have to be um, accepting as the analyst. You know, really, what answer am I am I going for? And and the answer is whatever gets you to what your design goal is. If if you're trying to redesign something uh, and and run sub subsequent designs. You want to get an idea of what ballpark of as far as accuracy are you in? It, it, it's notice that mesh one is at 26 ksi, mesh two is at 41 psi, ksi, etc. You know you, you want to get somewhere in the ballpark, but then the the question becomes, you know, do you need to refine it further? And and we want to use this this graph to kind of guide us there. That's all, and we'll show you how to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the advantages too of of running a coarser mesh is is it lets you see where you need localized refinement, and that makes it uh, handy. So and it's also much quicker. It gives you um, a solution quicker. It lets you see generally what's going on. Lets you go back and refine your mesh and identify where your where your max stresses are, your stress concentrations, and where you possibly have real stress concentrations and what you'll have to do to take care of those. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it might be some areas you ignore. You know, it might be, you know, there may be areas that you're you're not concerned about, you know, they're you know, it's it's a low stress and you don't need to do a mesh convergence on it. So what well, do we if have? you have to, <laughs> but one one thing to last thing to interject is, is if you have a very complicated model and it's using up a lot of your resources on your machine or, or taking a lot of time, you can use this study to, to control where the density of the mesh is from areas of least importance to areas of high importance. So that way you can solve these more complex models in a reasonable amount of time with a reasonable amount of accuracy. Right. I, don't, I, don't, I never have a model where I don't care about the mesh size. It's just unless it's unless it's such a simple model that mm -hmm. you know it, the speed is there, but it, it's rare. I mean, I, I, every model we care about the mesh size and and the runtime. So it's it's all about getting the fastest run we can and getting the most accuracy that we can, that we can. All right. All right. So uh, I got a couple of examples here. They're very simple examples, uh, just for the essence of speed here. Uh, I got a, a L bracket uh, fixed on the top, uh, a little downward force here. Right now, I just have a rather generic mesh setting here. Take a quick look at it. I, I have to find an element size of three. Everything in here is default settings. I haven't messed with any of that. Uh, there is no mesh refinement yet. Gone with the parabolic, and we'll just run an update again real quickly. There we go, mesh. So we'll run this load because uh, I'm also going to demonstrate uh, convergence here. Or run, sorry. Linear analysis are nice and quick. There we go. So we've got our stress. Uh, obviously, it's in the fillet there. It definitely where we would expect it at in this sort of situation. So we get in a stress of well, 32 uh, or 3 KSI. So let's let's go on and let's create another uh, analysis here and let's refine the mesh a little more here. So 0.3 was the previous one. Let's see, we can go with an overall mesh refinement. 
anything in the settings we want to tweak. Nothing really that I can see in this particular model that's necessary. But we can see here, I mean, I've refined it here. The model itself has refined overall. But as, as, as far as the mesh in here, this is very similar to what we had before. So let's go and let's... So you drop your mesh size from 0.3 to 0.09 and mm -hmm. overall, overall would refine it, but really nothing significant right where you think the high, where the high stress correct, is. Correct, correct. So, I mean, we could tweak this. We can, like, uh, adjust the growth rate here. Let's go with something like a larger growth rate and update the mesh. See, it didn't make a whole lot of change. So that's why usually we don't tweak around too much with the settings. I find with the advanced settings, that's why local refinement is usually usually a much nicer way to tweak a model. But uh, Right, you'd get refinement, but you just have to go to like 0 0.01 possibly. To even yeah, well, yeah, which, to which demonstrate would increase that. Your run time, which would increase your runtime overall. Yeah, so the more elements we add, we, we definitely increase the runtime. Uh, and so there's a trade off between accuracy and uh, speed. And here you can even see the meshing is you know, it's actually taking longer. Yes, we obviously from this, how long it's taking versus how small and simple this model is, I may have uh, overdid the mesh here. <laughs> <laughs> Which, which is, you know, that's something you're looking for. I mean, you, you know, I think your first few analyses, you want to see the meshing go pretty fast uh, and get a handle on, you know, how, how does that affect the runtime? You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm making changes up front, but how does that affect the real, you know, the overall runtime? And I think that's just something that, and you can see there, it's you really, <laughs> bla you really blasted it there, James. This, yes, this is a very ridiculous mesh here. Uh, so for the mesh table, I know we, we showed it in the presentation. I only have one part, so it doesn't make a big difference. But another nice thing about the mesh table, it, is, it does tell you how many uh, elements and nodes you get in your wow. model. So, uh, I mean, I'm looking at, what is that, 2.3 million quarter nodes? quarter of a million, yeah. <laughs> for, for such a tiny model as this, this... This would probably take up the last all of our time to run this analysis, but it, it and the accuracy, in my opinion, would actually be questionable because of how fine this is. Well, and I, I see, you, and, and that's a that's a good example. I mean, I see customers, and, and it's not often. I, I, I and it's not to blame them. I, it's something I see people wanting to do, as far as make one run, and they want to give it a lot of elements, and and it's it's not as efficient as a process to go through. That's all. Mm -hmm. So let's let's do. I'm not too happy with the mesh right here. So let's do a little refinement in this area. So uh, I'm going to show you how to add a refinement. Basically, right-click here. We're going to add mesh control. Uh, we've got a variety of different means to add, uh, you know, mesh control at, through the presentation. But I'm going to just go with the face. I'm going to add this one face. Uh, don't need, I mean, this is our area of, of importance. We saw that this is where our, our max stress is and this is where we expect it. So I'm going to tweak the mesh size here and go something with like, how about 0 0.05? Go OK. And we need to update the mesh. Do, do, do. Did that update? That wasn't much of an update. No. Uh, we can always go back in and edit. Uh, you're only going from a 0 .08 to like a 0 .0. Yeah, you know, it's really not not a big change, but that might that might be. Yeah. And you can hit the update all in the upper in the icons as well. Mm -hmm. Still not making a huge difference, is it? So the problem with is adjusting size yeah. is it's not a linear relationship. Uh, like if I make the size half as small uh, or edit or do a half the value. There we go. Starting to see it. Uh, a yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, don't, not ha uh, happy with this. All right, let's do a quick little run here.
Yeah, and I, ge I generally don't, I don't recommend making large changes. I, I, I like to see how my stresses converge. And I know you're going to get to this, James, but I, I like to see that because I like to see if I have any kind of a stress concentration. I mean, I know what to look mm -hmm. for from a stress concentration standpoint, but I like to see how my stresses build up. And it gives me an idea of really, you know, am I really going way overboard for my elements? You know, I, I want to run as efficiently as I want, to, as I can, as I mentioned. But I, I don't want to run too, you know, I, I just want to get to that point. I, I don't want to make a big deal of it. So I like to see two, three meshes kind of work my way up until I feel comfortable that I'm getting the accuracy that I need. Yeah, so so uh, the analysis here is run, and we can see our, our stress results have actually changed. We went from 3.2 to 3.6 KSI. Not a huge jump, but then again, if we looked at our, our mesh, uh, or, or change in mesh density on the face there, it wasn't very huge. So let's try uh, another analysis here. Uh, again, we will add uh, add mesh control. We'll s select this face here. We're going to go something with a little smaller here. How about uh, a point two? Uh, all our uh, all our settings here are again default. Let's see, reset the default, no change, and we'll go up mesh. There we go. That's that's a nicer, that's just finer there. But let's go with, I want to go a little finer. Let's see what that gives me. Here we go. That looks very nice. But you can see it doesn't grow very much from here. And that's, I've got a very high, uh, or the one, I got the default 1.5. Yeah. Uh, growth rate. Which is quick. Yeah, I will, that's a quick. That's a quick transition. In other words, right, James? Yeah, yeah. So we'll run this. We'll give it a a quick run and see what we get. Part of uh, basically knowing your mesh is experimenting with it. And so we got we've got a we didn't have a jump. I refined the mesh. It's significantly different. But my previous results were 3.6. I didn't pay attention after that, but we're 3.6, so we're within, we've got at least two significant digits in this results here. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that makes me feel fairly confident that I've, I've got a, a decent mesh here. Uh, there's no, I've refinement in the area of, of importance, and it hasn't changed significantly. And it's a nice uniform stress through that. Oh, oh one point I, I, I wanted to make, James, was um, mm -hmm. you're not going after a convergence for displacement. I mean, it, one of the things you mentioned early on, James, was, I mean, you, you picked a nice uniform mesh, you know, and, and, and it looked good, but what do we mean by that? What we mean is that there's enough elements through this entire part to accurately uh, depict what the overall stiffness is of the part. Therefore, we're going to get an accurate displacement. That's not what we're going after here. What we're refining is, is in the local, the high stress region, um, and we're trying to converge on stresses, not displacement. I just wanted to make that perfectly clear. We're, we're not going after convergence on displacements. As a matter of fact, if you looked at all the displacements up until now, they're going to be virtually identical. Why? Mm -hmm. Because you've accurately modeled your overall part. I mean, your part looks like your part. Therefore, displacements are going to be accurate. It's really the stresses we're going after for for some more accuracy with the mesh refinement. Correct. So, uh, so we're able to see that we've got convergence here, but what happens when you have a stress concentration? We'll see something completely different. So I've got virtually the same model here. Uh, but without a fillet here. I've got a nice coarse mesh on this one here already. And let's run the analysis here. So you've got a sharp corner in the model. And Correct. Oh, by the way, right where your high stress is going to be. <laughs> yes. Well, that's what I'm intending. But we can actually see, because this mesh is so coarse, actually my max stress isn't where it should be. Oh, yeah. 
I find that rather interesting. Well, look at it. It's it's 344 uh, psi. It's really low. Uh, we in and as Alan mentioned before, we would see displacement uh, convergence in this one because excuse me, how coarse we are. We actually probably don't actually see the correct amount of displacement here. Uh, it's the model is not behaving correctly. Or, or, or well, because we would see displacement actually converge. So there we go. Let's let's take a look at another model. This one just has a finer mesh on it. We can take a look at the settings here. All I've done is all this is default still. Uh, I've just got a mesh size of 0 0.1. Yeah, and there is no refinement on here. So let's run this analysis again. So this is an overall increase in mesh density again. Let's take a look at our von Mises. Ah, now it's moved and it has jumped dramatically. We've gone from 300 PSI to 1 KSI right now, and it's right here at the corner at a stress concentration. So we've seen our, you know, we've we've increased our mesh density, and we've run the analysis again. We've seen our stress has actually changed location. It's changed to where we expect it to be, but it's changed, and, and it's also dramatically increased. And maybe so, maybe I'll make a just to interject a point here, James. I mean, mm -hmm. the I think what you just showed was that you know we, we can look at mesh convergence but there can be a mesh density that is so coarse that it's it's really skewing the results and I think that's important to note I mean I think you know we're talking about stress convergence and using mesh to achieve that you know but there's really a, I mean I think there's a point very you know, at a very low mesh size or very large mesh size I should say to really watch things I mean this and again one reason we're showing you uh, how to you know, it, showing you the importance of mesh refinement I mean it could actually be skewing the results enough to where you know you, you just you're getting a result that just doesn't represent what the the reality is I mean I think there's a, a mesh density in other words that is so coarse that You've got to watch for that, and and that's when you can actually start seeing changes in displacement as as well. So just mm -hmm. be, just be aware of it. Yeah, there is an upper there is an upper as far as max element size, and there's a lower as far as minimum element size, where you're gonna you're gonna start seriously affecting the model, and you're gonna start diverging from reality. Yeah. Okay, and there's a there's a real refined there's a very refined. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's corner. delete that. So let's let's uh, let's go with uh, a generic mesh. This one I actually I like this one as far as overall uniformity. This is a really nice mesh, but we know it's not going to capture our, our our stress concentration very well here. So we don't need to mess around with anything in here right now. So what I want to do is actually add a refinement. There we go, add mesh control. And I'm going to use the edge on this one here because we've got a little corner here. So once, so for the mesh refinement again, James, you, once you've meshed the part, you right-click on mesh model and go to the, um, what was it, mesh control. Correct. Correct. Add mesh control right here. Okay. So I'm going to update the mesh here. Let's see what we get. It did not make as much of a change as I was hoping for. Oh, number of elements. Oops, sorry, I mistype. And before, I want to make sure that. There we go, reset the default. Uh, so we've got a nice, we've got a pretty fine mesh here. Let's see if we get an angle where we can get good contrast on that. But one thing, the one thing I don't really like is the transition of how the mesh is transitioning here. But I also want this to be 
Well, let, let's see. I don't like the transition very much. Because it's on an edge, I pretty much get one element away from that edge is really fine, and then it goes through that really huge transition really quickly out to the larger mesh size. So let's this this would be a good example of where we can tweak the element growth rate. And I'm going to drop this thing to, um, to 1.2. So you're going with a slower growth rate. Correct. So now we can see a nice, we see a bit of a smoother transition out from the center. And as we zoom out, we can, we can clearly see how much denser the mesh is here versus elsewhere. Uh, we can, well, let's play around with this a little bit more. Let's go the opposite way. What if I make this even larger value and uh, grow the mesh really quickly? Now we can see some distorted elements. I mean, look at look at how look at the shape of these elements right here. They're not very trite. Well, I don't know a good way to describe it. Not very equilateral. That's the word we're looking for. Mm -hmm. The more equilateral the elements are, the more accurate they tend to be mathematically. But we've got some here. They're just kind of skewered. And a and lot of times we refer to that as the aspect ratio, right, James? Correct. You know, the, 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 there's a very long um, length of a side of an element as, as compared to a short side of the element. So very large, larger uh, aspect ratios, we'll call it. Correct. Let's see if we can make some, some a little worse. Oop, wrong way. Ah, look at that. That is, that is definitely not a very good transition in mesh there. And we've got some very large ratios from this element length here to this one. There's a there's a huge difference there. So, anyways, let's go back and let's make this something a little bit more reasonable. Oops, this type 1.2 update mesh. There we go. Now we get this nice growth from there out. And I think that's important to note, James, is that I mean you're you're going by visual right now. I mean you're you're used to seeing you know, expecting a nice uniform mesh, something that gives you finer elements, but not, but nothing really skewed. So, I, and I think that's important. Correct. I think that's important for people to take a look at. I mean, why, you know, you could run an analysis, but, you know, if you already know that a really long skewed element in a high stress area is not what you're after, you're going to stop right here and, and adjust it. Mm-hmm. So, just something to note. I, I think that's important for everybody to know. I think you, you, you want to go by a visual just representation to see, you know, if it looks if it looks bad, you're probably going to get a bad, you know, you're going to get worse stress results. So now my mesh has grown again. Uh, we're up to 4 KSI. Not huge. I, I suspect my, my load isn't really massive enough, but if we were to keep refining this, we would just see the stress go up and up and up, but we can see how the stress is actually rather constrained to right here on this element. There is little transition of mesh, or, or the, the mesh transitions really quickly out from this, this peak stress up to areas of very, very low stress. Yeah, so that's it goes to like 500, it goes like 500 PSI when, you know, across one element. Correct, correct. So we, we get a significant drop. Here we go. Well, there's another, there's another value we can look at here. It's called the uh, mesh convergence error. Uh, we'll, uh, basically, uh, it's in here. It's in the results. It's one of the options down here towards, uh, towards the top, stress mesh convergence error. And this gives us an idea of of how much our mesh transitions really quickly. The higher the value, of course, the higher the number we see on the scale here means the, the faster the stress transitions from one element to the other. And, if, and as expected here, our, our concentration, our stress concentration, this, this sharp corner here is where our max stress is at. And it's where our worst uh, uh, convergences are where our worst transitions are going to be at. So that that basically sums up our 
our our journal here. I know I know the models are very simple. It's it's just to point out these specific areas. Uh, Alan mentioned it before. It's it's really is an art to uh, yeah. meshing. But uh, hopefully we've given you an understanding and some of the tools and basics to go out there to your comp your models and apply them to your specifics and get and reduce the chances of mesh dependency issues and make you more confident in your results. Uh, James, uh, if you don't mind, go, go back to the go back to the uh, inventor in CAD for a sec. Sure, sure. Oops. Oh. And uh, if I can hit the right key comma, there we go. If you go back to the um, if you go back to the mesh control, uh, even under the global and then settings. Oh, you want to uh, see those? Oh no, not the refinement. No, just the overall global mesh settings. Um, mm -hmm. And then settings. I mean, you, I just wanted to touch on some of these things. I mean, and and we're calling it an art, but I think, you know, I think there's you know, it's it's a little more than that. I mean, you as the analyst, you know, you you, you have controls here um, as far as the quality of the elements. I think the better quality elements you make, the better. The results you're going to get. That's the bottom line. Uh, refining and, until you're you've got the you know a comfortable convergence um, area that you've hit. But you know I, I think the key is that and and James pretty much nailed this on the head in this last example as far as the uniformity of the elements. We're not trying we're trying to refine, but we don't want to generate really skewed elements. And and some of the and that goes back to some of the quality. Controls, which I just want to touch on real quickly. They're they're here, but we we have them at such defaults that you know, for example, the max triangle angle and you know minimum triangle angle. I mean, those those things are you can change those, but they're pretty small. They're they're pretty reasonable to begin with. Put it that way. So, um, I don't know. Do you have anything else you can add about that, James, or if we set oh. up about this stuff? I can only speak from personal experiences that I find that the the triangle angles and the other features they can depend so heavily on what your your nominal mesh size is your and other sizes, values yeah. that they are really hard to control or get them to do what you want to do. Yeah. In other words, the the real control is your mesh size, which pretty mm -hmm. much. Dictates. It's, yeah, pretty much these things fall. They they pretty much fall long after that, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I think this brings us to uh, pretty much the end of our uh, presentation. Is it, do we have any questions out there? Yeah, we've done enough talking. Let's see what kind of questions we have on meshing out there. We do have some questions coming in. Uh, we have. One, uh, what is a good result for a mesh convergence error? And we also have one about the error result plot. Um, can you guys show uh, a visual indication of some of the mesh quality? Okay, so for the, the, the last one, the mesh quality here, uh, we do have uh, a tool here called uh, Check Mesh Quality. All my models are pretty much at this point going to be very well. They check the aspect ratio, which I mentioned before about those default, the, the distorted triangles. Skew here happens to do, that one's hard to describe, but imagine that's if we your, drew a line. That's your angle. That's your angle yeah. between elements, yeah, element edges. So we basically just check, uh, click the check, and it'll highlight the uh, the uh, failed areas, but right now we don't have anything. So let me... Let's go back, and I can I can make this fail for us. I think I can. Let's go for that uh, 2.5, or let's go ridiculous three, because we want this thing to fail. Okay. Well, hopefully that'll fail. That'll give us something. I hope. Uh, oops, wrong spot. Uh, 
So this is something you can check the quality of the elements right before you run the analysis. You don't even have to run the analysis for this, in other words, James. You can just correct, check correct. The, the quality of the elements as opposed as opposed to really relying on your you know your visual. You know, you can, you can come <laughs> in and, and look at aspect ratios, skewness. Jacobian we haven't touched on yet. Let's talk about that for just a sec, James. Sure. Um, uh, maybe okay, so there's Jacobian. Go ahead, yeah, sir, if maybe. you could, please. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, the Jacobian is is a matrix. Is a, it's a matrix. It's the inverse of your stiffness matrix. So what what's happening? And notice that you've got a fully meshed part. What we can do is we can assemble the stiffness matrix, take the inverse of that, which is really what the Jacobian is, and and see if anything shows up. In other words, what we're looking for there is something that is a negative number or is something that's a zero. So if something has a zero stiffness and we take, you know, as far as the stiffness of the element and we invert that, that's going to blow up things in the finite element analysis system. So something to check real quick. Um, but it's it's a deep dive into what you really the quality of the, the mesh is if you check the, the stiffness and therefore the Jacobian matrix. So um, but, you know, again, a lot of people just go ahead and run the analysis and, and see what happens. Now, if the Jacobian, if any terms in, are in there that are negative, which would indicate that it's a very poorly defined mesh, um, that's going to that's going to show up in the not only the Jacobian, but certainly in the solver. So you'll get a, you'll get an error about that. So it's a good check. Good check early on. Doesn't save you. It doesn't cost you any time. Thanks, Alan. We have, we have a couple more questions, and I want to make sure we have time to get to everyone. Um, we have uh, one that Andrew answered uh, in the question block there. Can you put a fillet in so we don't have a singularity and refine the mesh? Uh, I believe the first model was a, a good example of, of having a fillet mm -hmm. uh, in there. So uh, we'll have this... Uh, presentation recorded and we can go through um, you can review that information but if you just want to show that real quickly James oh you want to see how to add a fillet or because uh, we have a bracket here that has a fillet but the nice thing about INCAD here is that we can done with the environment I'll select this edge let's go fillet I don't know that looks like a good size save Back to INCAD, yeah, that mesh control lost it because it didn't have anything applied to because it wasn't there. Let's delete that. That edge is gone. And we'll, like, update all. And there we go. We've got a change in it. But you don't want to add a fillet unless your fillet really does exist in your, your, your actual uh, part, your object that you're creating, because otherwise you're, you're not truly representing what's going on. Great, thanks, James. And we have another question. Um, we're using a, a tet mesh here, and they would like to know if we can use a square mesh or different type elements in that mesh. Uh, can you step through any of the, the controls for that? Unfortunately, for solid elements, we only have tetrahedral meshes. There are no, uh, um, uh, sorry, blinking on the actual name on the quadratic elements. Right, yeah, eight noted. Yeah, yeah. Eight noted. We only we only have for, for INCAD. We only use the tetrahedral elements for solid. For uh, surface elements, we do have the quad elements. Uh, so, but and we do we do have some support for uh, we got beam, pipe, and there's a third one, but I can't remember in line in the form of a line element. All right, and then we have another question. I think two of these. I'm not sure we answered them, so I'll make sure we hit this one. Um, how do we interpret the error result plot? What is an acceptable value? And then we also have a, um, something similar to that. So if you could cover that. Uh, okay, okay, let's go to this one and... Let's go. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of a. I'll, I'll make a note here, James. Is that it's it's really more of a. It, it's a personal decision. I mean, every analyst is different. 
Um, some some need you know under one percent error. Some need under five percent. Some are you know, some some of the very initial designs you know kind of kicking the tires if you will. Um, maybe twenty percent is reasonable. So, um, but I think it, you know any, anything under twenty I think is, is reasonable. Um, but it depends, you know. It, it, there, there may be areas in the model that we don't care about, you know. And from a run standpoint, we don't want to refine, but other areas we do. So, um, but if it's if it's an area of interest, you know, definitely under 20, you know, 0 .02, 0 .01 would be would be what what, what we'd be going after. Yeah, we right. can see here that our our our. Uh, uh, convergence error here is actually up here at a constraint and we're not concerned about what's going on here this is our area of concern so we don't really need to worry too much about this transition here uh, but we can always always explore always play around with with the mesh to see if you got mesh uh, um, dependency areas like the first one of the uh, the elk bracket that didn't have the fillet on it we saw our mesh, our, our, our max stress was actually in a completely different area than what we would expect. So even though it's up here at the top, uh, in a more complicated model, maybe it's it's important. Maybe we need to refine the mesh there, see what's going on. Awesome. Thanks, Anything guys. Else, sir? It, it looks like we've uh, covered most of the questions. If you, if we didn't clarify something, uh, feel free to throw it in the, the questions box. And we have a few minutes left, so I will try to get to a, a couple more. That was a good point, James. I, I mean, as far as you know, don't feel like you can't experiment. I mean, that's what it's really about. It, it, the tools are there. All the features there to control the mesh and vary it, and 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 you want to see what effect that has. I mean, if it's a, you know, no doubt. Think of it as in another parameter to your design, and you want to find the value of that parameter that makes it constant, and you don't have to worry about it anymore. And so that's the idea of eliminating mesh dependency. By eliminating that, it's less of a factor to come into play into the accuracy of your results. And that's, that's what everybody's after, is accuracy. Solutions are easy. Accuracy is, is the challenge. Well, if we don't have any more questions, just to, in review, uh, we discussed the meshing controls, basic settings, uh, even went into some of the advanced settings, showed you the favorites of mine at least uh, to tweak. Uh, localized mesh control, it's in my opinion far handier than some of the, the other mesh controls because we can specifically control areas of the model. We can give the refinement right where we need it. Um, I hope we imparted onto you the importance of mesh convergence and uh, being able to eliminate mesh dependency and to help identify uh, stress concentrations. Uh, all this information that we've provided for you is, is going to be available on uh, our YouTube channel, but there's also the help. Uh, a lot of this information comes straight out of the help, and in fact, the the, there's a new guided tour. Uh, if you look at section seven and eight, is what we've covered in this. That talks about uh, general mesh settings, uh, mesh convergence, and the the local refinement. So please check out the help.